Yeah, thanks again for the invitation to come and speak at the Ohio Seed Improvement Seed School for uh, 2020. I'm sorry we weren't able to meet in person, but um, still excited to present a little bit of the research we've been doing. So with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we can get rolling. So again, I'm Dr. Alex Lindsay. I'm a crop ecophysiologist in the Department of Horticulture and Crop Science. I started here in 2015 and I've kind of built my research program around this idea of looking at abiotic stresses in Ohio corn production systems. So I wanted to focus on abiotic stress because over the last few years, we've been experiencing a little bit more extreme weather. We've seen an increase in precipitation over the last few decades compared to the previous 60 years in the upper Midwest. In addition to more precipitation in general, we're seeing an increase in the intensity of these events. And so we're getting more rain and it's coming down in heavier events. It's also predicted that we're gonna have an increase in consecutive dry days moving forward, suggesting that if our precipitation goes up, our rainfall intensity is going up, the number of days between rainfall events may also increase as well, which could lead to issues with drought during the season. And so we may have an increased situation where we have more stress happening. We could have lodging and defoliation if these precipitation events are coming with strong storms, with strong wind and potentially hail damage. We may also see an increase in water stress conditions from either drought from those consecutive dry days increasing or from waterlogging or flooding due to excessive precipitation at one time. When we see waterlogging in corn, we can see some different changes in morphology. In general, the plant will decrease its leaf area and reduce its shoot growth. And below ground, we see some interesting situations going on with the roots. We see an increase in depth after the flooding events end. And part of that may be driven due to the formation of cortical aranchyma. So cortical aranchyma is actually shown in this image here. It's essentially these large pockets that are existing within the root system. The way corn does it is that it actually takes the root parenchymal tissue that normally exists and it ends up killing off those cells. And so it doesn't have to maintain them metabolically. They're not using oxygen and the plant can use oxygen and resources to explore more after the flooding event. So essentially killing off the roots inside, the cells inside the roots helps to provide more resources for, for future exploration. Now, when we think about flooding in corn production systems, not only are we worried about the effects on the corn crop itself, but also on nutrients, particularly nitrogen. Nitrogen is extremely driven by biological processes and it's a very transient nutrient compared to phosphorus or potassium. In flooded conditions, we may end up experiencing things like denitrification, which transforms nitrate into its gaseous forms in anaerobic environments. So essentially the nitrate will denitrify and return back to the atmosphere. We could have a slowdown of the process of nitrification, which is the actual conversion of ammonium to nitrate due to limited microbial activity. And the other situation we can have is a, an increase in leaching where nitrate is moving out of the soil environment so the plant can't ever take it up. And so this could ultimately impact our fertilization practices. How are we supplying our nitrogen to corn and is it adequate, especially if we expect flooding to occur? So this leads to some modern questions that we have related to this topic. How do modern hybrids respond to flooding and how effective is a pre-flood nitrogen application at preserving crop yield after a flood is incurred? If a flood is incurred and the original plan was to come back and apply a side dress application, is it still worth doing it? Or is the crop damaged beyond repair? What impact might it have on yield and would it be economical to do this as well? Potentially this could lead to a diagnostic test that could be done by producers to help inform them if doing a post-flood nitrogen application is needed. So to look at this, we actually looked at this at two sites um, in kind of a preliminary study at the Waterman Agricultural Natural Resources Laboratory and at the Western Agricultural Research Station in South Charleston, Ohio as well. We ended up log waterlogging corn for zero, two, four, or six days. We didn't flood because 
completely submerging plants at V6 would be extremely difficult in a controlled environment situation. But we were able to achieve water logging conditions um, to help examine this effect. We had three different nitrogen application treatments. We had no nitrogen applied as kind of our baseline check, our 120 pounds of nitrogen applied pre-plant, and then 120 pounds applied pre-plant plus 60 pounds applied after water logging was finished as kind of that remedial side dress nitrogen application. Do we really need it? Taylor Dill was the master student working on this and she's pictured here on the slide. So none of this could have been done without her, her work on this project. So throughout the season, we collected information on stage and height, biomass. We also looked at the ear leaf end content, which Taylor is sampling um, to look and see what the plant nitrogen content was at pollination. Typically, this is when tissue sampling may be done in corn to look at nutrient levels, but it may be too late to really do anything about it if levels are too low. And so we also collected soil samples kind of pre and post flood to see if a soil sample earlier in the season may be adequate to determine if we had enough nitrogen left even after flooding was occurred. We did measure grain yield and partial return as these are kind of the, the big things. If it affects yield, you know, we're, we're interested. Flooding ended up delaying phenological development of the corn plants, particularly at the V4 or at the four and six day flood durations. So essentially these plants were behind the others um, after flooding was incurred, which was to be expected. Height and biomass also decreased with flooding, but nitrogen application increased height and biomass. So even if you had a flood condition, adding nitrogen pre-plant helped to kind of increase the height after flooding was occurred. We did see a change in root length and area as was expected. With flooding, we expect an increase in root length and that's what we observed in this study. Root length increased marginally. Uh, while it wasn't significant from a p-value standpoint, the length did increase. We also saw an increase in corresponding root area, suggesting that these roots were exploring more in a post-flood environment. There was no difference in biomass between these treatments as well, which suggests an increase in root porosity. Essentially, if the cells are being killed off inside of the root cortical tissue, you would expect that you'd have lower biomass, but an increase in area. And that's what we observed in this study with our increase in root porosity. We did see an increase in yield with nitrogen application. But when we flooded for six days, essentially it seemed like that 120 pounds applied pre-plant was absent after the flooding conditions were over. Same thing at the four day. But when we applied that 60 pounds of nitrogen post-flood, we saw a significant increase in yield for our two and four day flooding conditions. Six day flood also increased in yield, but not as dramatically. And it's not necessarily clear if this is because the plant was damaged to the point where it couldn't utilize the nitrogen applied, or if it would have been responsive to even more nitrogen had it been applied. Again, we only applied 60 pounds post flood. And so it could be a situation where more nitrogen may have been beneficial. To really further get at this question, we're actually starting a new project in 2021, where we're going to be kind of teasing more of this post flood response out um, to further supply um, nitrogen post-flood recommendations. Partial returns showed a very similar pattern and suggested that a post-flood nitrogen application was still economical regardless of your flood duration, particularly the, the six-day flood duration. Applying nitrogen post-flood did pay for itself and improved returns compared to doing nothing at all in those situations. Again, we looked at that soil test value, given that a soil test may be more informative and maybe a faster turnaround for supplying that supplemental nitrogen if needed compared to an ear leaf N value. But we did see that the ear leaf N and soil nitrate values post flood were related. And essentially at a 
soil test value of about 23 parts per million. If as long as we had 23 parts per million, we did not see an increase in leaf nitrogen value. Below 23 parts per million, we would have potentially seen an increase in ear leaf nitrogen had we applied more nitrogen. Similarly, we see that response for yield and the breakpoint is almost identical, 22 parts per million. As long as 22 parts per million were present in the soil, we didn't see an increase in yield if the values were above that. If the values were below 22 parts per million, we would have potentially seen an increase in yield from adding future nitrogen. But again, more work is needed to really expand this and really hone in on this. And again, we'll start that work in 2021. I wish I had the data, I just don't have it yet, but we're working on it. We saw a similar situation with a, a leaf test, but the relationship was not as strong. Again, we used a SPAD meter for this situation and future work is probably needed to, to further hone in on this. SPAD might be easier than a soil test to collect, but we will be also looking at NDVI as a possible way of measuring this as opposed to SPAD, as NDVI can be collected remotely. SPAD is a contact sensor and is needed for that. So again, that'll be part of that work starting in 2021. So in conclusion, we saw that root growth patterns were affected by four days of flooding and early season nitrogen did improve root growth following durations of four days or shorter. Cydrus nitrogen application increased yield in all cases and may be economically viable if flooding is experienced for six days or less. And a soil nitrate nitrogen test could hold utility in determining a rescue nitrogen application moving forward. But again, we're gonna be expanding this trial in 2021 to really further hone in on that information. So that concludes kind of the flooding and nitrogen, but the other aspect I wanted to point out is that with these strong storms comes wind and it can cause stress on the plant. And I say it can cause emotional stress because this is a picture of me in 2013, looking at one of my PhD trials um, that experienced lodging in 2013. When crops experience wind stress, it can come in the form of two versions. It can either be green snap where you have complete breakage of the stalk as we see in these images here, or it could just be lodging where the stalk remains intact, but the root mass is partially removed from the soil. And essentially you get this gooseneck recovery response in the plants. And I bring this up because we had a chance to collect some opportunistic data. I say opportunistic because it happened and then we had the chance to collect data on it. We didn't really choose for it to happen, but we ended up having these different corn hybrid by planting population studies being conducted already planned for those years. We had uh, two of these trials in 2011, two again in 2012 and three in 2013. In 2012 and 2013, we also had two studies that had a planting date component. In these studies, the populations ranged from 18 to 50,000 seeds per acre. So we had a wide range of seeding rates. We also had hybrid maturities ranging from 102 to 120 days, common uh, comparative relative maturity value. And I mentioned that because the storms came through on a single date each year during the late vegetative stages, roughly between V12 and V14 growth stage. So in 2011, this is the derecho that came through. Essentially, it started out in Iowa, moved its way through Ohio, then a second round came through later in the day, causing that wind in. Uh, damage. In 2012, this shows the track. It started around uh, northwestern Indiana and then came through very quickly uh, with wind gusts exceeding 81 miles an hour as it moved through parts of Ohio. And so this caused similar damage um, to our plots as we saw in 2011. In 2013, while it wasn't a derecho, we did see severe thunderstorms, flooding, and three tornadoes in the state, which ended up mimicking the data, um, the lodging damage that we saw in 2012 and 2011. And so after compiling all of this data and starting to look at it kind of across these um, situations, we saw a slight positive association with root lodging and green snap, suggesting that plants that were more susceptible to root lodging were also more susceptible to green snap. This may have been related to growth stage at the time of those uh, events coming through. Uh, 
Some stages may be more prone to damage than others. Again, the younger the plant is, the more resilient it can be to wind damage. The further it is in its growth phase, the more susceptible it may be to that damage. But it may also suggest there were hybrid differences out there. And so that's something that we might wanna look at moving forward. This kind of lends this idea that there may be some susceptibility differences in hybrids to wind damage. Root lodging was not strongly correlated to relative maturity in these studies, although there was a slight negative association where relative maturity increased and root lodging slightly decreased. There was no relationship between green snap and relative maturity either. And so this may suggest some hybrid differences, but it may also be related to stage, given that the 120, the later maturing hybrids may have been less tall, may have been less farther along in their growth progression compared to the early maturities. And again, I mentioned this because our late planted corn trials in 2013 and 2012 almost had no lodging associated with them, and they would have been at the early vegetative growth stages. And so it, it kind of lends this idea that it may be related to stage, but it also may have some hybrid relationships because looking at all of these dots, these are different hybrids within a relative maturity group. So we have some concerns related to yield data from these opportunistic data collection, right? So we had this storm come through and I was worried we wouldn't be able to use the data from a yield perspective. What effect would lodging have on grain yield? And how did the stage of lodging impact its yield potential? So doing some searching in the literature, I found this paper from 1988 where they actually simulated wind lodging on corn growth and grain yield. Looking at some of their data, there was minimal loss if, yield, if lodging occurred at the V10 growth stage. At the V14 growth stage, yield loss ranged between 5 and 15%. And the most detrimental yield loss came at the V17 to R1 growth stages and was about 15 to 30% of the unlodged control. And so for me as a researcher, this was a little bit of a relief because ours happened at that V14 growth stage. The other thing to note is that there weren't really any evaluations of lodging at the R stages for this trial. So after this experience, it kind of led to some questions. What do more modern hybrids look like in their yield response to simulated lodging? Again, that paper is from 1988. And we know now that a lot of our root structures of modern hybrids are less prolific than earlier versions. Additionally, what would root lodging look like at higher populations? In the 1988 paper, they conducted that at 25,000 plants per acre. But our modern producers are planting anywhere from 30 to 36 or greater plants per acre from a stand perspective. And I bring this up because in the opportunistic data, again, we had hybrid by population studies. And so if we look at across populations, we see that as population increased, there was a significant increase in root lodging. So it suggests that seeding rate increases root lodging susceptibility as it increases as well. However, there's really no effect of seeding rate on green snap in the plots that we observed. So could this mean that more modern hybrids and planting situations are more susceptible to lodging than they used to be? And if so, we really need to start to look at this at, at modern populations to really get a better idea on yield implications of lodging if it occurs at this growth stage. So the third question was, what would the impacts of root lodging be on the corn if it were in the reproductive stages? And I mentioned this kind of happens and plants are susceptible from V10 to V14. And you wonder, lodging during reproductive stages? I don't know. Well, this year we had it. 2020 gave us a couple major problems. This is showing Iowa from space. July 24th, everything looks good. August 11th, we have these giant storm swaths that came through causing substantial damage. And again, this is from space and we can see the difference in these two images. If we look at it up close on in person, these are images that were borrowed from Twitter of some of the damage that was localized. Essentially the corn was at the R3 to R4 growth stage when these giant derechos came through. We see substantial wind loss, we see leaf shredding, we see stalk breakage 
And at the end of the season, they saw premature deterioration of the root systems, causing fast dry down and maturation in these systems. And so this kind of led to this question, has corn response to simulated wind lodging changed over time? And is it affected particularly in the reproductive growth stages? So we had two objectives in this study and it was to evaluate the effect of lodging on development and grain yield using modern hybrids and seeding rates and to determine underlying physiological factors causing yield decreases due to root lodging. We had these eight row plots that we lodged. We seeded them at 36,000 seeds per acre and we had three modern hybrids of similar relative maturity. We chose these because they had varied quality root scores. Essentially, the higher the value, the stronger the root system was rated to be. And so we could really start to look at if there are potential hybrid differences um, in these situations. We simulated the lodging events using a board at V10, V13 to 14, VT to R1, and R3 growth stages. And we also had a non-lodged control for comparison. I mentioned we simulated lodging using the board and this is what it ended up looking like. So we had a two by four, we had a couple individuals out and after this ground was irrigated, we were able to push the plants over with the board, essentially moving it from one place in the, the field to another, pushing the plants down was a very effective way at causing the lodging to occur. And essentially this is what the, the plot looked like after the lodging event occurred. We did lodging at the V14 growth stage and this is showing some of that recovery. Again, we had the root systems partially popped out of the ground and we saw that curvature or goosenecking starting to occur. What I found interesting is that there was some differences in how the hybrids actually recovered. In this one, you can see there's kind of a, a mess of leaves. It's really difficult to see from one end of the plot to the other. Whereas in this one, recovery was much more stringent and rigid, and you can actually see the sunlight on the other side of the plot. So there could be some differences in hybrids ability to recover from a lodging event. This is showing what a VT lodging ended up looking like. So this is a V14 in the background. The one in the foreground here is VT lodging. And essentially what we have is a mess of plants that are pushed onto one another. Tassels are kind of bending every which way. Even though this was all lodged in one direction, um, the response was pretty dramatic in this situation. In the background now, you can actually see a plant that was lodged at the V10 growth stage with minor recovery. Uh, plant looks pretty good otherwise. So some of the measurements we collected, including silking date, uh, total leaf number, dominant ear leaf number to see if those things changed as a response to lodging. We looked at total curved stock length and recovery at R4. We also measured grain yield and moisture at the end of the season and also quantified kind of abnormal ear situations. So plants that were barren or had nubbin ears, which essentially mean 100 kernels or fewer on the ear. Normally ears produce 500 to 700 kernels each. We also rated the ears for any abnormalities that might be present. Some of the abnormalities I'm talking about include vivipary, which is essentially this plant was still attached to the, uh, this cob was still attached to the plant, but it was in close contact with the ground, leading to some of the kernels that were on the ear starting to sprout and create new plants. And so this is very common in some of our VT and R1 and R3 lodging treatments. There was also increased disease presence, which could increase the chances of vivipary in those situations. Another abnormality that we were rating for was zippering. Essentially, this is common when pollination is reduced. Essentially, what it means is there's fewer kernels that are being pollinated, potentially on one portion of the ear. And so as kernel pollination gets poorer in those rows, the rating would become more and more severe. We looked at jumbling, which also is associated with poor pollination issues. Essentially, the kernels get kind of strange in their arrangements. So this would be a two, a three, and a five in that situation. And we also looked at basal emptiness. Um, essentially, the pollination starts in the middle of the ear and moves towards the tip and towards the base. Uh, 
And so poor pollination at the base could be denoted by basal emptiness. So what we observed in this study across the three years is that while we did have different hybrids with different root scores, they differed from one another but responded similarly to the lodging treatments. So I'm only going to be presenting the data across lodging treatments at this point. Looking at silking date, visual recovery, total leaf number and ear number, and our final curved stalk length, what we observed was that the V13 lodging delayed silking in those plots. So it took a little bit longer for the silks to emerge from those uh, plants compared to the other treatments. Again, we saw no difference in the VT and R3 because essentially lodging had not yet occurred. So we expected those to be similar to the non-treated. Recovery decreased with root lodging. Essentially, the later the lodging occurred, the less recovery we saw at the R4 growth stage. There really was no difference in leaf number and total leaf number were fairly similar. Final curve stock, stock length was a little bit less when lodged at V10 and V13, possibly because those plants were re responding to the lodging and creating that gooseneck response as opposed to actually devoting energy towards internode elongation. Looking at the yield and change from 1988, we saw that at the V10 growth stage, we had similar lodging losses in yield. So essentially 95% of yield was retained, about a 5% yield loss. At the V13 growth stage, however, at modern, with modern hybrids at modern populations, we saw substantially more yield loss in our current study as compared to in the past. So past work showed about a 10% uh, yield loss when lodged at the V13 to V15 growth stage. And in our situation, we saw about a 22% yield loss as compared to the 10% yield loss previously. So it was greater than in 1988. Similarly, we saw a greater yield loss in our study about a 43% yield loss when lodged at pollination. And we saw about a 33% yield loss at the R3 growth stage, which again was not measured previously. So this is kind of our new data that this study contributes. So where is that yield loss coming from? Some of the yield loss is coming from an increase in the number of plants that exhibited barren um, ears. Essentially the ears were there, but were not pollinated or the ears were absent altogether. So at V13 and the VT to R1 growth stage, we had the greatest proportion of barren plants. Also at the VT to R1 growth stage, some of the yield loss we were seeing was coming from poor pollination. We had significantly higher zippering and jumbling as compared to our other lodging treatments, suggesting poor pollination in these scenarios. We saw that as lodging increased, later in the season, we saw a decrease in kernels per plant as well. So essentially kernel set and kernel fill was decreased with lodging at later growth stages, contributing to the higher yield loss in those scenarios. The only situation where we saw a decrease in kernel weight was actually when lodging occurred at the R3 growth stage, suggesting poor test weight, poor filling um, during the R5 stages and things like that. We also saw an increase in vivipary and grain moisture content when lodging occurred at the VT and R3 growth stage. And some of this may have been due to those ears being in close proximity to the ground, stimulating those ears or those kernels to start to germinate and leading to higher overall grain moisture content. Those ears were not off the ground, so it was more difficult for the grain to dry. So in summary, we didn't really see differences in response to lodging from our modern hybrids. Main leaf formation really wasn't affected by lodging. And the yield losses in our current study were greater than reported. But again, we had higher seeding rates and we had longer relative maturities in this study, which may have contributed to some of those differences. The yield losses were coming from multiple causes, reduced kernel production, poor pollination, reduced kernel number, were all contributing in some facet um, to the yield losses we saw in this study. The other situation we saw at R3 especially was that increase in vivipary, grain moisture content, and reduced kernel weight. So not only could you have a loss in yield, but 
test weight and grain quality could be significantly negatively impacted in those situations. So in summary, corn can respond after environmental stress and we can expect some yield loss, but it's not necessarily complete devastation in many cases. Oftentimes corn can rebound after a stress event occurs. Management practices can make a difference and it may require some in-season adjustments especially when it comes to flooding and nitrogen management. Uh, we may need to consider a post-flood nitrogen application. We may also need to look at our seeding rates as well if we are worried about potentially having issues with root lodging in season. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the lab mates that helped to kind of make this happen. Our funding sources for this research, uh, Dr. Peter Thomason for his assistance with doing a lot of these projects. And I also wanted to thank the Ohio Seed Improvement Association for the invitation to present at the Seed School this year. Thanks, and we'll talk to you again soon.